So welcome uh, to another community call where today we actually have a special event and we plan to do a brainstorming session on peer review with Eugene, the founder of Smart Contract Research Forum. I'll let uh, Eugene, you introduce your whole project and everything in a second. But the idea here is that they are also working on a decentralized peer review feature. And Eugene and I thought it would be cool if uh, we got our communities together to share feedback on both of our approaches in order to create an open line of communication moving forward. So that way, not only our two projects, but anybody else who is working on open peer review, uh, you know, will feel comfortable kind of sharing their learnings with everyone else in the community. So I guess to get started, kind of like our agenda essentially is that we plan to have um, Eugene present his idea for peer review for what they're working on currently and then share feedback. And then we'll have Kobe present uh, Research Hub's initial thoughts for the peer review feature that we're gonna build uh, and get feedback from everybody. And then at the end, we'll kind of like compare and contrast and see like, you know, um, I guess provide feedback in general on like the total approaches on like ways we can improve going into the future. So I guess to get started, Eugene, thanks for coming. I'm excited to go to your guys' community call later in the week, but yeah, we'd love to learn more about uh, Smart Contract Research Forum and what you guys are experimenting with. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. And yeah, thank you to the Research Hub community for, for hosting us. Uh, so yeah, I'm Eugene. I'm uh, currently the, the uh, head of operations and outreach at the Smart Contract Research Forum. I'd love to get to say that I'm the founder, but uh, it was founded by Sergey Nazarov, who is currently a, a co-founder of Chainlink, and Richard Brown, who is the former head of community at MakerDAO and has been helping to build out uh, SCURF. And Rich and I work very closely together. Um, and you're happy to answer any SCURF-related questions if and as they come up. But the real focus today is to kind of share what we're currently thinking about uh, in terms of some of our, uh, in terms of the peer review experimentation that we're really excited to run in the coming months. Uh, and I see both uh, Nick and Umar both join the call and they have, uh, they were kind enough to both reply to uh, our open bounty uh, when we were at ETH Denver and uh, yeah, are uh, kind of collaborating with us and helping us make these uh, first round of experiments possible. So very much appreciative to both of them, uh, both generally joining our uh, our crew to help out with this experiment and joining today in case I'm missing anything in terms of the thinking and some of the open questions we're delving into. But admittedly, it's very uh, early days at this point still. Uh, the goal for us is to figure out uh, what is sort of the minimum viable open peer review uh, experimentation that we can run to provide peer review for independent researchers? We are specifically starting with independent researchers because they are somewhat a neglected class of researcher in terms of actually getting peer review. Unless you are already, you have your PhD or you have strong enough connections, most independent researchers aren't going to make it to the natures of the world or to your, you know, most of your academic conferences or things along those lines. Uh, and in reality, Web3 uh, or anything blockchain, cryptocurrency, et cetera, related uh, that has real research components to it, not looking at sort of market prices and things like that, uh, but the actual you know, underlying cryptography, underlying game theory, uh, governance, mechanism design, all of the actual research components that build up uh, and into Web3. A lot of the innovations that have come through in this space over the last decade or so have not been out of academia and have not been out of massive corporate or traditional research environments. So our logic with kind of starting with folks who are more of the independent researcher class is because they don't currently have this avenue. And we want to experiment with some elements of, well, A, just providing it to them for free, uh, paying peer reviewers in the process of reviewing their work. Uh, and trying to uh, slowly introduce more and more tenants of you know, open peer review and its various components to understand and sort of A-B test some different approaches towards peer review and see what leads to the best quality improvement uh, of the actual product, uh, as well as generally uh, might provide insights for other domains where folks are thinking of experimenting with or improving peer review. So the way we're approaching it right now is in the next month or so, we are defining a basic peer review process, pulling from you know different open peer review processes that exist out there. Uh, I know, uh, I think it was F1000 and their uh, meta-analysis of open peer review and what is uh, part of peer review. Uh, we are not shooting for sort of all of the tenants and it must be open across every possible vector of openness. Uh, we are still kind of in the process of this week, next week, defining what is the minimum amount of openness in our opinion that will qualify this as open peer review. Uh, and we definitely want there to be transparency of you know, the initial work product, all of the elements of review, uh, and then the final work product, uh, as well as um, 
transparency on who did the review. Eventually, we, we are interested in experimenting with pseudo-anonymity, not full anonymity, but with pseudo-anonymity. If someone can continuously gain reputation being pseudo-anonymous, uh, we are open to seeing that because we don't want to just immediately assume that everyone on the planet is comfortable disclosing their full identity for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so we do want to provide people that kind of uh, you know, protection or at least option uh, in some kind of fashion. Uh, I've already mentioned that a very important tenant for us is actually compensating people for doing peer review, and we are trying to understand the best structure for doing so. The immediate feedback that we got from some of the first faculty members that we spoke to was that, you know, doing an hourly uh, just doesn't feel right for most people. It feels like too big of a jump to go from, uh, you know, effectively having it be service as part of your actual work of being a professor or being part of a conference to getting an hourly salary for it. So uh, we are very interested in exploring what a rotating fellowship model could look like, uh, sort of having fellows by topic area on six to 12 month bases. And again, anyone who would request the review and eventually once this actually scales up from a handful of selected groups that are opting into getting peer review to being anyone can apply to getting open peer review, the selection criteria, because we're just not going to have enough people to provide everyone in the world with open peer review and figuring out the selection criteria of who will get those early access peer review is a challenge that we have not worked through yet. Uh, and uh, we're not rushing to because we still have to run our first experiments where we just select everyone where folks opt in. And again, we don't want to get sort of bogged down by trying to answer all the questions, but understanding what are the immediate concerns that we do need to address run the experiment as quickly as we can, get feedback from everyone who partook in it, uh, share all of that publicly, and then keep iterating like that until we feel like we converge on a process that's actually working well. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, uh, let me just see if there is, you know, this doc is, is too sloppy to share on a recorded call, so I will just talk about it some more. But, um, you know, in, in general, we're currently in the process of identifying some initial independent researchers who want to opt into peer review. Uh, I'm part of this one working group where we were able to issue a, a number of groups looking at reward systems in uh, crypto economic uh, kind of communities uh, and looking at some of the, the successes and failures of those. So we're, we're speaking to one of those researchers to get open peer review. Uh, I also spoke to a sort of private research lab that also open sources a lot of their work and they've done some great work around computer uh, computer aided governance. Uh, around building modeling tools for people to structure governance tools. Uh, and so we're seeing if they have any research that they would want to opt into it. But we only want about two or three uh, research products, you know, research outputs to put through this process, given how early stage it is and given how many variables there will be to tweak over time. And so first is identify some open uh, peer reviewers, excuse me, some open, uh, some projects that want to opt into getting open peer review. Uh, with the help of uh, Umar and Nick, we're currently working on uh, kind of working through some general questions. Again, what is the minimum amount of openness? What does our process look like? What is the tooling that we're going to use? Uh, and we might just start with GitHub because that is uh, readily available and free, though we are also exploring some other tools. I think next week I'm speaking to some folks from the decentralized science team uh, as they have are apparently building a product uh, around this. Um, and yeah, I can find their link and share it later. Uh, and I actually caught up with someone from Block Science today, and they mentioned that they are working on something that might be relevant for us as well. So we're going to chat with them to, to get a better understanding of their tooling. But again, we're not trying to be perfect in this first go around. So uh, using GitHub seems like a great kind of fallback option that we can use. So once we know uh, who wants the peer review, once we pick the tool, once we've written out our basic process of how we're going to go about this, we want everyone to feel comfortable with the process and be very much aware of it. We're also putting together kind of a loose uh, advisory board or working group around this, or I don't know what you want to call it, but uh, we want to pull together some folks who have actively been thinking about peer review for some time now and to at least give us some feedback on our process. Uh, and we're also exploring what does actually engaging a group of maybe eight to, to 16 different advisors and giving them small grants to con commit some time to giving us consistent feedback over the next six months uh, to make sure that our process is as sound as it can be. And we're pulling from folks from a different variety of different backgrounds, uh, including other you know, decentralized research communities, folks who have been doing open science, meta research, et cetera, not touching anything Web3 related, uh, as well as just some academics who have very strong feelings on the peer review process. And so at this point, 
uh, again, we're, we're very much kind of mapping out our internal process. We've started talking to some potential advisors. We've started talking to some people who want to opt into peer review. And our goal is that by the end of April uh, and by the Dev Connect Week uh, events that are coming up the week of April 18th uh, at the latest kind of the, the week following that, so we can actually propose here is our peer review process. Here are the two to three people getting peer review. And then we would do select matchmaking uh, and curate the peer reviewers. So we are not going to do an open call for, hey, who in the world wants to come peer review this paper? We are going to be the ones kind of doing selective matchmaking saying, hey, this paper touches on governance, but really has a small economics component and a small uh, you know, uh, CS component. So we need folks from a variety of different backgrounds who can speak to different parts of the paper. And we realize that this curation model is absolutely not scalable. And again, we are not trying to make this perfect to start, but our initial goal, right? If all else is a failure in this, we want to at least provide two to three people really high quality peer review on their work, right? After doing this experiment, we could realize this took a thousand hours and way too much effort and it's just not worth it. But at the very least, that is sort of the minimum positive outcome that we want from this first experiment is to try to actually help a few people who don't currently have a review structure to turn to to improve their product and to share this entire experiment as openly as we can to contribute to the general body of knowledge around uh, how to improve an experiment around peer review. So that's kind of the, the gist of it. Uh, I don't know if Nick or Umar, if either one of you have thought I, I either missed anything or if there are any other elements you want to cover that are top of your mind as we're kind of really just right starting to write out and doing the research going into writing out our process. Um, but otherwise, yeah, that's kind of the high level and we're happy to zoom into any of those elements if it makes sense. But yeah, I don't know, Nick or Umar, anything on your mind or? Um, nothing coming to the top of my mind. I thought you did a good job of reviewing everything. Same. Uh, I'll just say hi to everyone and, and Pat and uh, looking forward to having a good discussion. Cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks for sharing. So so if anybody has any questions, ideas, feedback, you know, feel free to let it fly. Um, one thing that I think is really cool is GitHub can totally work for this kind of thing. Um, one of my favorite scientists is Casey Green, who used to be at UPenn. I think he's at University of Colorado now. But um, they like just put together like a crowdsourced review of COVID-19 papers, just like kind of like organically, um, just in a GitHub repo where people would share papers and then like openly share kind of their personal reviews. So yeah, I think there's precedent for GitHub being able to do the trick here. So excited to see what you guys are able to come up with. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'll make sure that we check that one out. Yeah, and there is one other tool um, web hypothesis that is. I'll send that in the chat in a second. Um, but that allows you to highlight text and actually comment right on the specific lines of text, which is another feature that's interesting. Yeah, COVID, please. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thanks for sharing that, uh, Eugene. It's very, uh, very interesting and uh, very similar to what we're trying to, to build here. Um, so thanks again. Um, question, I'm curious about the crypto economic incentives. I know that um, you might have touched on it, but uh, wondering what your, your thoughts are at the moment, like uh, just anything that you can share here on this topic. I know it's a really broad topic. Um, just curious if, uh, like how much, if you've given it some thought and what your thoughts are on that topic. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the 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 academic -y answer, it depends. Uh, but in, in something more concrete and less avoiding the question, uh, I mean, I think it's right. My only honest response is I'm open to seeing experiments, but I'm not convinced that tokenization solves all incentive problems. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that I'm really excited to see groups like Research Hub, like VitaDAO, uh, and other groups that are actively experimenting with tokenization in different ways. Uh, you know, in two weeks from tomorrow, I will be hosting an event in Pittsburgh with a CMU professor uh, and the executive director of MetaGov to have this also a, a similar type of discussion. And I mean, on, right, the, the, the crypto bull in me is very much like, yes, DAOify it and add a token and all these wonderful things will happen. Mm -hmm. But having paid attention to DAOs for the better part of six years now uh, and being part of building a Web3 organization that is not touching a token at all, uh, and still just seeing the, the standard human problems that get in the way of, uh, of you know, a tooling solving certain other issues. Um, 
Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think that I'm I would be worried to immediately inject tokenization into peer review because I think the class of highest quality peer reviewers would be highly turned off by that model. Hmm. So even if it is the right thing to do, I think your average academic would be like, oh, there's a peer review token? Mm, not for me. No, thank you. Right. Like they they don't even want to hear the, the peer review discussions about how do we fix academic peer review? And that's why we chose to do independent researchers, because then that's more disarming for them. And they're more comfortable to be like, oh, I can get a fellowship to help some people who will never compete with me from a publishing perspective. And so would I love to see more experiments along those uh, lines uh, run? Absolutely. Do we plan on tokenizing anything in the immediate future? Not at all. Uh, and part of the logic is, again, just trying to think of, right, A, how do we just start doing some A-B tests and getting some experiments and data under our belt and not just having to read through other people's research and how do we actually you know, do our own experimentation? And the actual kind of goal, uh, the way I see it going is, if we can start pulling in academics who are high quality folks to do these kinds of peer reviews, especially for say at the PhD postdoc level that they're still aspiring to you know, go the tenure track and play that game. And so if we can get them not only excited to get our grant and to help us do this peer review, but they actually wanna list it on their resume. And then someone eventually reads that and cares that it's on their resume. That's an important thing that we're shooting for because that just shows, that, that would be a very clear indicator of the quality of this kind of peer review happening. So we're much more uh, worried to start about how do we maximize the quality of the review being done and of the final product. And we are just in a convenient position where uh, we can kind of have a reasonable runway of paying fellowships and, and, and you know incentivizing in different ways that might be more palatable that we would rather not rush to inject tokenization, which might just complicate things further. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks for answering that question. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> so your thoughts are like basically A-B test start with like a grant that uh, from my understanding that, and I'm not a scientist, so sorry if I'm saying something crazy, but like the grant money would go to the um, reviewers themselves as a first step and then like slowly kind of like figure out what the crypto economic model is and how that grant can be replaced with something else is that is that what you're thinking very open to it i'm generally uh, i found myself constantly being in conversations of like i just want to see how far public goods can get us and how far can kind of grant-based models and not needing that permanent incentive and i'm very aware and you know i'll be the first to say like that will absolutely have its limitations i just want to know the bounds of those limitations first before saying like oh we need a token here we absolutely it's like i don't know do we if we just have a, a 10 million dollars a year to give out for fellowship grants mm -hmm. for open peer reviewers maybe that's enough and maybe that kind of structure can also be made sustainable by getting you know consistent commits from the largest crypto foundations considering they're all swimming in more money than they know what to do with so that's where it's also uh, it's an interesting time in crypto that if you can show value money can come in different forms whether it's launching a token or just consistent grants uh, and so, yeah, I, I just won't personally want to push the grants model as soon as possible, though if there's any evidence showing that tokenizing will have a significant increase in uh, quality and incentive alignment, you know, we, we are not ideologically committed to never tokenizing anything. We just kind of want to see how far we can get without it, while others, uh, you know, are more apt and more comfortable with running the tokenized experiments. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that that makes sense. I have a sorry, one final question about the um the the papers that will be eligible for peer review. I know you mentioned like independent um researchers, but are you thinking that uh the papers that will be eligible for peer review will come from the independent researchers or the independent researchers are the ones that will be doing the peer review? I just wanted to make like a, a clarification on that. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. So yeah, it would be that uh, the research output would need to come from an independent peer review, from an independent researcher. Uh, and I realized I forgot to mention one other aspect of the experiment that we want to run, which is divorcing review and publication, right? Right now, how do you actually get peer review as an academic? You put forth towards a certain journal, towards a certain conference, towards something concrete where you will get to present or put out your paper. We would actually like to divorce that structure and just say, hey, how do we just help you improve your output? You want to go publish? Cool. You can go publish anywhere you want after that. But that's not our, like, you go do what you want to do. We're just trying to open source the peer review part because we've noticed a lot of 
the ins or not a lot, but a certain portion of the incentive problems around peer review actually stem because of how closely linked the review is to the output and the fact that there can be other biases that creep in because of that structure. So what happens when you divorce it and just make a, fu a fully independent peer review apparatus? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, um, fully agree. Uh, I'm curious what you think about the concept of post-publication peer review. Because I do think a lot of the motivation for academics right now, like peer review is part of the publication process, right? And so like you go through a lot of work and like revisions and stuff based on reviewers feedback, because at the end of the day, in theory, there's a nice line in your CV that comes out of it. And so if you're motivated by like producing better science, which is definitely a better motivation than a publication at the end, I'm wondering if maybe like it could happen well, I think the first issue that is in my head is that there's got to be something in it for people, you know, like eventually these independent researchers will want to publish in a peer reviewed journal. So I imagine it will get peer reviewed again or, or just shared on medium or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I, I wonder if like there's a way to help to identify like bad peer reviewed papers, you know, from these fellows where they're spending their time looking at stuff that's already been, you know, in theory peer reviewed and published. But now we have like a second layer to help to identify like the low quality papers because that definitely exists. Yeah, curious what you think about post publication peer review in kind of like your paradigm. Yeah, I mean, that's and I see post publication peer review, I guess, depends on the specifics of how one is defining it. But that could also just include like crowdsource peer review or, or uh, just from the actual timing of publication. So pub, um, pub is a good example, I think. Sorry, pub, pub peer, okay. they're, they're like the anonymous post publication peer review website. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So I do think that yeah, so I think for the initial point that we want to start with, it's much more of, you know, the highly curated matchmaking version. But the, sort of the, and we haven't discussed this in detail, so Nick and Umar, especially if you have slightly different visions of how you see this going forward, like, please feel free to jump in as well. But the way I'm thinking of it is that I would love for there to be a, like, let's just say today I finished my research and tomorrow I opt in to open peer review. That should be a curated element on the fellowship model of like, there are people who are compensated somewhere on this planet to do a direct thing and like consistently do that as they're available. And on the other side, to create more of a, of a bounty structure for open peer review. Because I do love the idea that anyone in the world can just come in and crowdsource. What I don't love in that model is right away, it's very easy to be like, yay, crowdsource, open source, and still not pay anyone. And like, if people are doing work, they should be paid especially in a space like Web3, there's no shortage of money around. It's just a question of distribution. Uh, so I think that there are ways to establish those kind of norms where you could have, and I, I'm hesitant to use the word bounty because I feel like bounties, especially on like mass scale bounties, have a tendency to devolve to minimum amount of work done to, to get the bounty. Whereas I feel like if you have a deep culture in place before you open up for these kind of bounties, then people will genuinely do it for the work and then just be happy to not have to do it for free anymore. Um, but yeah, I think that that's absolutely one element of it. But also just coming back to what you were mentioning around Theoretically, if someone went through this and then wants to go to a major publication venue, again, the group that we're starting with, I would actually love to know the data. And we, I, I don't know how feasible it would be to, to do this. There would have to be a lot of blog scraping given the Web3 space realities. But sort of what percentage of research outputs in Web3 actually hit any kind of real publication venue by traditional academic standards? I think a, a, an aggressive estimate is 10 to 15%. I would not be shocked if it's sub 5%. And so, right, like, does Vitalik have a single actual peer reviewed academically published journal? Like, I'm sure he does, but like, go a few notches down in terms of brain power uh, and impact in the space, and it immediately drops to zero, right? And like, I know I was chatting with someone today who's an independent researcher, and he can get his stuff published because he has a PhD and knows all the right people and can still play that game. But your average brainiac sitting behind a laptop thinking of innovations is not worried about like where is this going they're probably throwing it up on like medium or mirror and tweeting about it and then move either trying to implement it or moving on to the next thing and that's where we think that that's where we want to experiment the most is how can we a in the short term how can we just help them improve their product but then B, with generally what Scurf is building in terms of having this larger research community, how do we immediately get them to plug into like, oh, you just thought of a, of a zero knowledge proof improvement? 
great. Here are three protocols actively building products with that. Do you want to go talk to them? Here's five researchers in the academic environment looking at related questions. Do you want to go talk to them if you can collaborate? And a big part of how we're envisioning things at SCURF is intentional facilitation and matchmaking. And so we do want to get to a point where within a year or two, uh, and you know, we incentivize the, the gathering of what are the biggest problems that people are working on? Who's actually working on which problems? And then we want to build the operational infrastructure to connect the dots in between at no cost to any other parties. So how do we really provide this kind of facilitation and matchmaking as a public good uh, in, in Web3 parlance? Uh, one thing I wanted to mention is uh, the possibility of, so I, 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 in thinking of like how to incentivize peer review, the strongest incentive is probably financial, but there's also this incentive of like social reputation of like, oh, there's this really amazing peer review that was done of a fantastic paper. And if you go check the author's name on that peer review, it's, you know, Eugene Leventhal. And now Eugene has this great reputation because he's known to be someone who writes the best peer reviews. Uh, and, uh, I guess, you know, that does require, um, not anonymous review in order to build that sort of personal reputation. Um, uh, but I'm hopeful that that could be another incentive for peer reviewers is, um, let's, let's have transparency. Let's be like totally open about, uh, what it is that we think of, uh, the papers. And then in that way, sort of build the system where you're actually incentivized to just tell the truth about what you think of something and do it consistently so that um, you get to be known as someone who does that. And in science today, I think there's already a lot of like social reputational systems. Like, you know, people fight for prestige. They, they want to be known as someone who published in nature. But what if we could replace the incentive of publishing in nature with um, you have had your paper reviewed by you know, Eugene, Newton, and Einstein, and they all said it was great. And that's uh, an, an incentive, even without going through uh, nature, to get peer reviewed um, and uh, to s s sort of build that social reputation. Or vice versa, uh, Patrick, you were talking about like bad papers. Like if you write a bad paper and Eugene like goes and trashes it, like, you know, that's that's bad for your uh, reputation um, or, or social, uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. I mean, I could definitely see like a, a positive peer review from Einstein being way better signal than a publication in Nature. So I, I could definitely see that. Like if you can get big name like peer reviewers to to help to lend their credibility towards other work that they think is important, um, that would be super cool. Uh, I just shared PubWands, which I, I don't know if you guys have stumbled across this, but um, Clarivate Analytics bought this a couple years ago, but this is kind of like a a LinkedIn for peer review. Like it's like got leaderboards and people can claim like their peer review outputs in theory if they want to like include it in a tenure application or something. And so they've done this in a in a like non pseudonymous way, like just totally transparent. The reviews aren't there, but people can claim like their work history. Interesting. Yeah, I definitely want to look into that. Yeah, we should definitely look into that more to just better understand, especially given that most peer reviews are anonymous. How do they verify that? Do they need a multiple com multi party confirmation to say that you know, I did actually review that paper if the only people who know that are like the conference proceeding chair uh, or the journal editor. Uh, yeah, because I, I wonder how they figure that out on the back end, but that, that feels like a solvable problem. Yeah, I want to say Clarivit is plugged into one of the big journal companies, so I bet they're on the inside. Gotcha. I got a mole on the inside. Yeah. Got to check that out. Yeah, if anyone just is aware of any other good quality open peer review processes uh, or just any other elements that you think we should be thinking of, again, when it comes to like the pseudo anonymous nature, uh, when it comes to the reputation gathering, like some of these things are going to be elements that we want to phase into this process over time. But for now, it's sort of figuring out. Um, I always have mixed feelings about using startup terminology in academic directions. But again, like what is the minimum viable open peer review process, right? What is the least amount of both review and openness that is necessary to actually provide something useful to an independent researcher? Uh, and what is the form that that would take and how to actually process that in the most convenient and uh, quick time?
Yeah, please. I just shared uh, the journal for open source software here too, where they do, I think, open peer reviews on GitHub uh, with all their publications. Kobe? Yeah, I'm just curious if uh, you guys have given thought into um, what the what are the statuses that the peer review should have. So like uh, I've seen, I've just looked at a bunch in, of uh, tools out there and um, the, the, the statuses on each platform varies. And I think that the status is, it got me thinking about like uh, the status of a peer review and, and the importance of it, because um, I do think it has some merit and, uh, and it needs to be considered. So like I've seen something like approved status versus rejected status versus pending status. So <clears throat> that kind of like gets you, I guess that sort of thinking can get you down the, um, the track of like what is the objective of a peer review uh but you know that's that aside um we don't have to talk about that i'm just curious yeah if you've given thought into the statuses and in an ideal world <clears throat> what should uh, these different statuses of a peer reviewed um be yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, from the perspective that we've been thinking about it, especially in the early stage, not not trying to dodge a question, but I think we're trying to dodge having to avoid that, uh, having to avoid answering that too early. Um, that's a tough one, yeah. Yeah, because if we are curating everything and handholding through the process, and we will try to make it time bound in a reasonable manner that is opted into and agreed upon by the reviewers, the reviewees, I don't know, do we have a term for one being reviewed? Um, but for the reviewers, the reviewees and the advisors. And so we're just keeping this with a tight knit enough group, you know, all in all, I'm thinking mm. we might be dealing with 20 people across three reviews, including our little advisor group to start. So that feels like a, a small enough group to just, you know, coordinate, manage, uh, hound people, you know, like, hey, why is this taking so long? And just like double check with things. But I, I feel like that's fundamentally missing mm -hmm. the point of, of the question that you're asking, though. Um, so I don't know. I think that in in its most basic form, it's once someone has completed a work, then it's the opting into this peer review, right? Because it's not that this is a required review to then go do another thing. So there needs to be the opt-in. There's the, the matching process of finding the right reviewers. Then there's the question of, do you want to let reviewers start reviewing to be staggered? As in, if you know, we found someone who's the CS person and they're willing to jump in right away, but we also need someone who's a PhD in econ and for some reason it's just taking a few more weeks to find. Um, you know, do we want to then wait until the last review has started? Or especially if it is a genuinely more open, continuous process, uh, is it possible to kind of compartmentalize it? Which I feel like generally touches on the question of like micro publication and should you be trying to publish the whole thing or can you compartmentalize your work into its most uh, chunkable portions and just try to release those? Um, but even if kind of a, avoiding that added element, you know, I think that if running it in a continuous fashion, then it's effectively begun. And at that, that's at the moment when the first person has committed to reviewing it. Uh, and that continues running until enough people, you know, say we make a requirement of like, for it to be considered reviewed, we need at least four people to give their full feedback uh, or whatever number. Uh, but like, once you've hit that requisite number and they complete it, then it's done. Um, that feels like the, the most basic process that we could do on the continuous side. I was wondering if there are any kind of uh, elements of that status that you are either most uh, worried about replicating from the academic and of, of the traditional environment or uh, most excited about seeing experimentation around? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'm personally not so sure myself. That's why I <laughs> I asked. Um, yeah, I guess um, it really comes down for me. And like, uh, as I mentioned, I'm not super familiar with the process because I'm not uh, in the field, but um, it comes down to um i guess like up until this point from my understanding is a lot of the peer reviews are done by the journals themselves in order to get a piece of work published now we want to decouple that so that uh the peer review can happen independently of uh the publication that seems like a good idea to me but now the notion of what it means to be approved is a little different because like approved in a journal means like okay now it's published but now in this uh, divorce world, what does it approved mean? And 
should there be another status instead? So I don't know. No. Yeah, I just need to, uh, I guess, uh, something to think about for all of us. Like it's Absolutely. a meaningful contribution to the field, right? In theory, like this is something new that is meaningful and other people should read, I feel like is kind mm. of a review. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and there's the, and I feel like another element there, right? If If someone will be seeking a certain version of publication, right? If you go to the natures of the world, then you will be needing to hit their bar and their version of your review. I think another interesting open question at this point is, what exactly are decentralized journals going to do? Because within a year or two, there's going to be a bunch of them popping up in different topic areas. And it's going to be interesting to see how they try to either embed peer review process and similarly be a publisher and say, you know, for it to be out of our uh, environment, we have to have it meet our rigor and standard. But on the flip side, I've also talked to enough academics who have both done reviewed and been reviewed a handful of times who are like, I know that part of this lengthy feedback that I got was just so they could look smarter in front of the, the conference proceeding hosts. And just to get to use a bunch of big fancy words to make it look, look, look at how much I know. And when they really read it and had a few other people sanity check them on it, they're like, there was like three sentences of useful feedback in here. And then like seven paragraphs are just like running around in circles of the theory to kind of just restate it. And so... Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think that is an open challenge and an open issue, and we are not pretending to have a solution for it yet. Mm -hmm. And we hope to, as we continue running these experiments, so at least in my mind, for the next, say, three to six months, I'm actually not worried about where things get published unless someone specifically asks us for help around that of like, hey, we don't just want to put this up on our own blog. What are other alternatives of where this can go? And for us, it would be informal channels of like, well, of course, you can use our forum. If you want, we can do a podcast episode about it, right? We're not going to try to replicate something where we're pretending we're a publisher and not a platform. And so I think that's very important for how we're running it. And then as other people take up the mantle of creating decentralized publishing venues to work hand in hand with them to understand what is your actual quality and rigor that you demand and how do we close that gap between our two, right? Because if we're consistently outputting here and groups mm -hmm. consistently want to appear, then how effective is what we're doing? And that feels like we're wasting a bunch of people's time and money and we should figure out how to better collaborate to get it up to the point where it would be publishable for the people who want that. Because even if someone doesn't want their thing published, they still should have access to a structure that provides them the most intellectual rigor possible, or at least that's kind of our view in starting this. Yeah, no, that, that's, uh, thank you. That that's actually makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, thanks. I would love to see in like a few months, like uh, what are some of the lessons learned? So maybe we can sink back in a few months. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we can do another swap once we actually have results. Yeah. Malik, I saw you had your hand up a second ago. Yeah, I was just um, gonna like give like uh, one small comment. Like, is um, I, I like this idea about like pre-publication review. It could be something like just to give an example in medicine. There is, um, you know, like CMS, uh, which is the uh, you know Medicare services requires certain amount of um, things from hospitals and clinics. Hey, you should have your labs this way. Your um, EHR should be this way. You should not have coffee on the desk. Blah blah blah. And then there is this organization called JACO, uh, some of you would have heard of it, uh, which kind of does this process before CMS arrives. And so if you have this like stamping from JACO saying, hey, they are JACO certified, then you know the, 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 the review process with CMS goes a lot smoother. So I guess your platform is something like that for a journal that um, if somebody wants to go forward that, hey, like, hey, this has already been reviewed. Um, and, um, you know, it has gone through a rigorous process um, and next step, like, I mean, of course, the journal is going to do its due diligence, but it would help the researchers like maybe fast track it. So I like the idea. Yeah. yeah and that's one thing where thank you for the comment. Yeah, and we're, we're actively thinking about, you know, does it make sense to slowly start building relationships with the IEEE's and the ACM's and the top journals that, that produce some of this Web3 content? to start thinking about how can we be that kind of feeder to, to fast track the peer review there, or how much do we want to make an ideological commitment of like, hey, if you want to go to publish in traditional channels, like we'll make an intro if we can, but that's not our game. And we're only going to push towards decentralized modes of publication. Uh, and I don't think we're at the point of needing to make that decision. Uh, and until there is a healthier landscape of decentralized publishing options, we would rather just watch this ecosystem evolve 
because you know i think best case scenario we have 12 to 18 months of active experimentation ahead of us before we come out with some concrete of like here's what we really think and here's what we need five million dollars for to make possible for x amount of researchers in this space and we just don't want to rush into making decisions that we don't need to yet but that's absolutely something that we're keeping in mind and thinking about because again at the very least how do we give people that rigor without forcing them to say you must go through that channel to get that rigor I don't know. Yes. Hello, Eugene, and thank you for your enthusiasm. It's very important. Uh, I want to ask you if you think that marketplaces would would evolve in a different way, especially the data marketplaces. How do you see that? Especially which marketplaces? Sorry, the, I didn't catch the word. The data market. The data marketplaces. Yes. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question that I feel like has a lot of dimensions to it uh, in terms of right the changing nature of publication because we're still kind of right presumably in this discussion we're still kind of talking about text in something that somewhat replicates you know wanting to get to a major journal publication we're not really thinking of like multimodal publication and how do you actually you know add the data sets to it or add video components to it or fundamentally rethink the process of what uh, research outputs should be. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't mean to give a cop-out answer, but my only honest answer is I. Did we get Eugene frozen for you guys too? Yeah. Yeah. He's frozen in kind of a funny pose too. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Yeah, yeah it's pretty right. funny. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So let, me, let me shoot him a quick DM so he knows that he's uh, frozen on our side. We got about 15 minutes left anyway, so maybe it makes sense to uh, we can present kind of our designs for how we're thinking about peer review and get feedback there and then uh, uh, call it a, a call it a day. Could we do you mind uh, presenting that quickly? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, let's just see if we could get Eugene back before you uh, this dive good. dive too far in because I'm sure he would want to hear this. Um, Sure. Sorry, I know we're tight on time. Oh, is he back? Hey. I did not uh, make my internet magically disappear to avoid answering the question. It genuinely, my Wi-Fi dropped out. My apologies. Um, but yeah, I, I, just to, to finish the thought, I don't know where exactly it got lost, but I think that the question of marketplaces, uh, there was also a question of like tokenization earlier around some of these elements and what that does or doesn't create. Um, the type of human that I am and the way that I'm wired, I like whenever I hear money entering an equation, I immediately think of like negative incentives coming in, or at least that's how I've uh, seen more from history. That's not to say a blanket statement of like money is evil or something uh, that base. But I, I just always get worried about groups that rush to the marketplace without building the community and the core value adds first. Do I think there's room for creating marketplaces around secondary uh, around research, whether it's the data or uh, you know like even retroactive funding? You never know which research will be most impactful 20 years from now. So how do you actually set it up so that people can get paid for, uh, commensurate to impact or things like that? So I think that these are very important questions. I have an itching suspicion I will not be the one coming up with any groundbreaking things on that side, just because I'm always like, well, let's see how much we can do if we just give people grants and like don't set up markets and that kind of thing. Uh, but again, I, that's just one of those where um, my personal ideology can't help creep into the way I think about it. And that might mature over the coming years uh, as we experiment more and actually get hands on with it, as opposed to just kind of seeing it as an outsider. Thank you. Cool. So Eugene, if it makes sense to you, we can uh, quickly present kind of what we're thinking about peer review wise and then hear what everybody thinks. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you can you all see my screen? Looking good. <clears throat> yeah, so we've given it some uh, the peer review uh, thing some thought. However, uh, what I'm going to show you is kind of like not necessarily what we're thinking. Uh, this is really like early designs, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. <clears throat> 
So the starting point, uh, let me take a step back. <clears throat> so the starting point would be in the um, paper page. Can you see it? Yep. OK, cool, yeah. Um, so like, um, a peer review section on the right, uh, there'll be a call to action to write a review. Now, that is a little bit different than what we talked about, where you have kind of a matchmaking happening between a peer reviewer and the author of a publication. This is what I'm showing here is more of a crowdsourced uh, like flow. So you would click write a review. Anyone can come to this uh, paper page, click write a re review. And then they will be shown this particular form. Now, the fields here, totally subject to change. But there will be some like uh, some like you know some open-ended information that we require. Some like maybe like uh, you know radio button specific answers and uh, some status. So like approved or like uh, I think someone mentioned completed can be good. And you would basically um, <clears throat> submit a review and. We move on to the next step. Uh, uh, this one is just showing a filled out state, so we can skip that. So anyway, the, the review, once the review is published, and this won't happen at this point, the exact point in time, but the idea is that both the, um, the author and the person that completed the review should get financially incentivized. Uh, Eugene, you made a lot of really good points about uh, the fact that, you know, we need to be uh, it's something that we need to evaluate and, and be extra cautious about because when you enter money, money into the equation, bad things could happen. Uh, but that's the uh, high level idea that the author and the reviewer would be incentivized. Um, then this particular state shows uh, an author receiving a notification that their publication has been peer reviewed. And um, so here in the, and I don't think it's shown here, but like the idea here is that um, yes, the author will get uh, some kind of a notification here saying um, someone like reviewed their paper. But in addition, what we're thinking um, is that somewhere in the feed, we will make some kind of a, um, some kind of a uh, demarcation like specifically outlining papers that have been peer reviewed from those that have not. So, and, and we can even use a status to our advantage. So like, let's say something has been peer reviewed, but the status is not completed. Maybe it needs some attention and we can use also, um, you know, it can bring some attention to the community saying like, Hey, this paper needs some, uh, some attention and, uh, or like maybe if the, there was one peer review and we need like a, a minimum of three, if we wanna go down that route of like having a minimum number of peer reviews, then we can also like uh, specify that the paper needs additional peer reviews. So that's something we can do somewhere in the feed, though it's not shown here. But uh, yeah, you can use your imagination. <clears throat> um, and in this particular state, uh, so I don't think uh, we need to go over this one, but I guess uh, there is like a couple of other interesting things I want to show. <clears throat> so there is another idea of like uh, that we talked about of like uh, <clears throat> basically, let's go scroll a little bit up to the top. Basically, uh, another idea of like, uh, you know, we've shown here like a crowdsource model of like anyone can go in and write a review. Now there is also the idea that uh, there'll be more matchmaking happening. <clears throat> and instead the CTA, the call to action button would say request a review. And in which case we're thinking we have uh, an editor program or we have like, you know, vetted individuals that own the platform. Uh, we're thinking that one of the, one of their responsibilities could be to actually um, kind of handle this uh, matchmaking process. So rather than anyone writing a review, uh, maybe alternatively or in addition, they could help facilitate uh, this matchmaking process. And a request would go to their inbox and then they can kind of like take it from there. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess uh, we also have like some, like quickly shown here some like uh, what a queue of of like a person's papers to to be reviewed can look like. But uh, again, I don't think it's uh, it's meaningful to go into detail. I'm just going to quickly scan and see if there is uh, anything else that uh, I think we should discuss. Uh, seems like we reviewed the basic. Um, so yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, wondering if uh, you have any thoughts or any suggestions. Would love to hear anything. Kobe, you said you are an assignment. List, but you clearly have published a paper that proved the earth revolved around the sun so <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is yeah that's impressive um uh, i do have one question uh, i noticed the notification said you and the author have been rewarded 100 rsc uh it, was, uh, it totally you know makes sense given all, everything we've discussed about it's uh rewarding the reviewer i was curious uh why also the author mm -hmm. Um, this comes yeah, from... I think, uh, I think, uh, Joyce can add to that, but like one of the ideas that we had, we wanted to create some kind of an incentive where we want people to publish content, um, regardless of like, if the publication, like, uh, I guess, test their, um, validates their, their hypothesis or not. Um, so we wanted, we basically want you know, more content to be published and less content to be hidden away because the hypothesis was uh, a null hypothesis. And we're thinking maybe one way of doing it is to get more people to publish and then reward them for their uh, kind of like putting their papers out there. But uh, I'm sure Joyce has a lot more to say about that topic. Yeah, so I think like the, the first piece is that this is a very early design iteration that's basically, we're using it to brainstorm more or less. So some of the small details, um, they'll all probably change. This is like a, a piece of content to help us think better. Where the author getting rewarded alongside with the reviewer comes from is the Center for Open Science. This is uh, kind of like the GitHub for Open Science where people can share uh, like files uh, attached to their study, also preprints. They host preprint servers. And one thing they do that's kind of cool is they add badges to preprints that are uploaded to Open Science Framework, where you can say, hey, did the authors have a conflict of interest? Is there public data available with this study? And was this study pre-registered? And so one thing that Open Science Framework has found is that authors will just say anything here. So they'll say there's a pre-registration but when you go and look at the pre-registration, it actually has nothing to do with the study and how it was actually conducted. And so uh, Open Science Framework is thinking about collaborating with us in a way where they wanna award tokens to um, anyone on the internet who can essentially verify that this pre-registration is descriptive of the methods used in the study. Same thing with the public data, same thing with the conflicts of interest. And so their thinking is that they want authors uh, to have an incentive to go through this added layer of scrutiny. And so if the author makes a little bit of money and the peer reviewer makes a little bit of money, it's a win-win-win situation. And so that, that's uh, kind of coming from uh, the Center for Open Sciences thought process. I think one other important part of our peer review feature that we want to do is have some kind of like numerical score associated with the review. Um, so in theory, peer reviews right now are qualitative. Uh, it's hard to like look at a peer review and know whether it's good or bad. You actually have to read it. And so um, here's an example of something that happened on our website. There was a paper posted. Uh, of, it was a bunch of case studies, peer reviewed, published in a journal that said sitting near electronics might affect blood sugar levels in pre-diabetic and diabetic individuals. So it's like a pretty you know inflammatory uh, title, like lots going on here, kind of exciting. And someone actually came in and uh, like did a small peer review um, saying if you Google the author's name, like pseudoscience, there's a lot of like sketchy stuff in their past and that like this is really just like two or three case studies. It's not a randomized controlled trial or anything. And so ideally what we'd like to have is someone like Alex be able to come in and like provide a score on a couple of different like dimensions about the paper. So that way, when new people show up to this paper and they're like, oh, crap, like sitting near electronics is going to mess with my blood sugar levels. If there's a little meter next to it that says this is 20 percent quality 
or like 80% of peer reviewers think that this can't be replicated. Uh, kind of similar to like Rotten Tomatoes almost, where there's like a quality score of like uh, both experts and like, uh, you know, the regular audience. We're thinking about having something similar where there's like a, a matchmaking peer review with experts, where there's an expert score from people in the field who are evaluating the paper. But then there's also an audience score of anyone who wants to share their like thoughts on the paper can share review too, and uh, kind of condensing it down to metrics. So that way when uh, you know, a random person on the internet stumbles across this paper, they have context from both experts and the crowd on the potential like quality of the paper in order to better interpret its findings. I love that, that sounds awesome. Uh, Nick and I were actually just talking a bit about Rotten Tomatoes this morning. <laughs> yeah, I remember our um, one of our engineers, Patrick Liu, mentioned this idea like a year ago, like stealing from Rotten Tomatoes. And I was like, no way, like that's so unprofessional. But like as time has gone on, I've been like, oh man, Rotten Tomatoes, that is like a lot of information and not a lot of, uh, you know, words there. Connor? Connor, do you have a question? I guess, does uh, anybody else have thoughts on kind of how we're thinking about peer review initially? This is, we're, we're probably not gonna start building this out for at least a month or six weeks. Safik? Uh, yeah, so I was also just concerned about how we will manage the quality of the reviews to begin with. Like, so for example, uh, how do we prevent somebody from doing just the minimum amount necessary and gather a lot of RSS? And secondly, knowing how the internet is, uh, how do we make sure that people aren't just uh, publishing stuff on the search hub just to get some, uh, just to get people riled up and do a lot of reviews of it, which would in turn give them a lot of RSC despite the quality of their work. So they could be inflammatory, for example, uh, the paper you showed us so they could say something weird like uh, like sitting near electronic gadgets can harm diabetic people and they'll get a lot of negative reviews for it but they will still be earning 100 rsc per negative review so how will we make sure that that doesn't happen a lot i think the short answer is human moderation so kind of in the same way that our forum exists now, like we get a lot of spammers who post things just to earn RSC. And the way we combat against it is having a bunch of awesome humans who are like manually essentially curating the content uh, within Research Hub. So this process would likely also be overseen by a human. So if a like editor wanted to recruit a peer reviewer there would be like a person to person contact point there where if the peer review was not sufficient, the editor would be able to let them know um, in order to give that feedback before it was actually published openly. Um, in addition, like if crowdsourced reviews came in and a bunch of them were low quality, just trying to earn uh, tokens, essentially, the editor would have the ability to essentially remove uh, like peer reviews that are clearly not um, like well intentioned and are more about earning tokens. So yeah, I think a, a human element um, to like individually have an opinion on whether a crowdsourced review is quality or not is probably what we'll start out with. But you're right, there's going to be like a million ways people game it. So I'm sure it'll iterate like a ton uh, over time. Eugene on the quality score. Uh, Sentiment. Yeah. yeah totally. no, I was just listening to a podcast this morning when I went for a walk, and it was about a contentious research question and how one uh, study from, uh, I think it was Brown University's Public School of Health, uh, was like widely cited as like the cornerstone of why policymakers are making the choice they are. And then as soon as another researcher looked at it, they're like, you realize your methods are fundamentally flawed because you went to a biased data set. And so like everyone there is gonna lean in one direction and it's not actually an objective measure. So like that should have limited its ability. And I wonder, uh, I'm unfortunately gonna have to jump so I won't be able to stick around for the answer, but I'll watch the recording later, but would love to hear of like, as especially Research Hub expands and there's more of like the preprint publication and potentially even adding more and more clear elements to it, 
are there ways that people can specifically just react to like, hey, I have a deep methods question because like, are you sure? And to actually make the the generation of that research, that initial research project more collaborative instead of being like, hey, here's me emerging out of my research bunker world. Look at my work. It's like, well, no, no, no. Let me start sharing this ahead of time. But I realize like that's such a huge culture shift. Like that is so not the norm of research and that would scare away a lot of researchers and i've even seen folks jump into the web3 space of like how do i make sure no one steals my idea i don't know you build it first like just go do it and like that's really the only way you could guarantee something like that so um yeah yeah research in public and like doing much more of that out in the open so so short answer pre-registrations i think pre-registrations are awesome in that they make research higher quality and that you have to outline your plan for the whole project beforehand so that way people can like basically share criticisms beforehand. And if you deviate from that plan, uh, the results are put into question. So I think pre-registrations are like amazing tools that should be used more and would increase the quality of research. Open Science Framework, again, has done some awesome work there where they'll pay people like $1,000 to share pre-registration. And then they earn it like on the eventual publication of the study. So I, I think that's one way to do it. Um, I, I like the idea of multiple multidisciplinary reviews. Uh, there's like the, the Cochrane um, format for reviewing papers has different stuff like like methodology, you know, one to 10, like, is this like state of the art? Uh, is it like a standard procedure? Then they'll have like statistical review. And so they break the paper down on like different axes and like each axis is kind of like has a separate expertise. So I think it would make sense to have like, uh, you know, interdisciplinary, uh, like a bunch of different expertises of reviewers to come in to share their opinions on a paper. Um, th does that help to answer the question? Yeah, no, that, that, that was good. I appreciate that. And I'm just dropping some info to, to stay connected. I hate to be rude, but I do, I do unfortunately have to jump. But yeah, thank you, Patrick, for inviting and thank you all for a, a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And I just message if anyone wants to join, the Thursday one and hopefully get research help presenting to our community and, and turn the tables a little bit. We'd love to have as many of y'all uh, join as are available. So, yeah. Yeah. W one last thing, Eugene. I mean, this opens the discussion for property rights and the digital uh, tokenization of the property rights. So this could be something for the marketplace, like as you mentioned before. Absolutely. And that's where I'll just plug VitaDAO's work, because I think what they're doing in terms of IP NFTs is a really mm -hmm. interesting structure. And I'm really excited to see more groups specifically focusing on the patent ownership or the IP rights around their work uh, and how we can benefit from that as it rolls out. So I appreciate you uh, you plugging that, Iona. Yes. Thanks for joining, Eugene. See ya. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, thanks everybody for providing feedback. Um, I will talk to Eugene and get a link to their projects, uh, Telegram or Slack and share. So if anybody wants to go over there and help provide feedback, um, it, it would be awesome to get some like cross pollination of ideas going on. Um, yeah, I guess so. Thanks again, everybody for sticking around for the hour, sharing thoughts on peer review. Um, is, is there anything else, any feedback that anybody has for us for the next week? Cool. That sounds good to me. Well, until next time. See you later. See ya. Thank you. Thank you. See ya.